Oops, shall we try that again? That's better. We may mock, but you can't blame the boy. It's been a while since we were out with a centerfire rifle. However, this we morning can we can dust off the cobwebs and carpe diem. Seize the day. What we're looking for this morning, if we can, is if we can find a yearling doe. I'm not overly keen on shooting mature animals this time of year, just purely and simply for the fact that the foetuses this time of year tend to be getting quite large. The other thing that we're going to be looking for this morning is we're going to be trying to account for a few foxes. We've got a lot of foxes back on this ground and we've, again, because of the weather, we've just not been able to, uh, to keep up with them. Gary and Roy scan for fallow, but there's nothing where he'd hoped they might rest up. So with the coast clear and a few other areas to hit after this one, Roy doesn't mind potentially upsetting the neighbours with some fox calling once he's changed to a lighter bullet. What I'm doing is just taking out the 90 grains and just putting in, I think they're 55 those ones. But with the normal ammunition, it does group quite well. So the 90s at distance, you've just got to come up a few clicks on the scope. But as long as you know exactly what rounds you've chambered, then you know exactly where to shoot with them. But I just prefer a slightly lighter round for the foxes. Just quick expansion. That's one, that's one, that's one. Roy lights the fuse and within a matter of seconds spots a fox charging towards us. Unfortunately, David doesn't, even though it's there. I know, look, there it is, in the frame. What are you doing, man? Frustratingly for Roy, David just can't make it out. I must just add at this point that things do improve as the morning progresses. As we regroup, Gary tells us that he spotted deer during the calling. David's bad eyesight might have actually done us a favour. As we get close, we bounce a young doe. Stalk slowly down there. We'll go slowly down this way, and we'll get the other side of that thicket. And then we'll just see if they trickle back out and shoot them in here. We split up to see if either one of them can get onto her, but in the meantime, up pops Roy's buck. Nervously, he checks Gary remembers it is just young does today. As we watch the young doe come back into sight, Roy takes his chance. She leaps forward and runs, typical for a heart shot. And down. Well, we just got that young fellow though there. And I'm pleased that we took her because I think she was actually on her own that one. And when you've got a deer like that in an area like this, where we've got so many dog walkers, they're the ones that tend to get caught against the fences or pushed up against the fences and attacked. She did run, unfortunately. I don't uh, yeah, if you can drop them on the spot, it's a, a lot nicer, but obviously she's been quite revved up because we've moved her once or twice. Roy heads to the spot where the deer was shot. He does this as a matter of course to build up a forensic picture. He interprets the signs as they might prove useful the next time when the deer doesn't fall within view. So we've got perfect blood here where the outshot is. So this is where the, uh, the bullet struck. And then we've got a nice blood trail leading off there and obviously the disturbance in the leaf litter where she ran. We're 20 yards on from the initial out spot and then all of a sudden the blood really is pumping out. So as she's running, it's pumping out of her body. So the, the, the motion of her running is causing compression and causing the heart to pump. And so we're really getting some serious outbursts of blood here. And if you look further up on this fence line, it's sprayed all the way up here and along as if somebody's opened a tap. You can see her tracks here, and you can see she was really struggling. She was really sort of running and trying to push out. So the toes have gone in there and pushing back where she's, where she's struggling here to stand up. So again, it's always a good sign to look out for if you've got nothing else to go on. And she's just dropped just over there. If you look where she was standing, she was slightly quartering away. So we've gone in there, that should have hit the heart perfectly and out just on the back end of the shoulder there. 
The young doe looks healthy and the shot has done exactly as the deer's reaction suggests. So we have just completely obliterated and bifurcated the top of the heart and the base of the lungs there. Uh, she was a strong little girl. And amazingly, when you look at the fat on the internal organs there, she was doing incredibly well. All in her, all around her kidneys and whatever. Had a very good amount of fat on there. So uh, she hasn't been doing badly. Quite interesting just to see what she's been eating. And again, mainly grazing, as we'd expect. There's a few bits of nuts and whatever else in there. And I think that's really why they've done so well this year. There was just so much natural food about this winter. The deer have been foraging very well on the beech mast, on the acorns, and the chestnuts and what have you. So it's uh, not surprising that they are doing quite well and they're carrying that much fat coming out of the winter. But then again, we've really not had it that cold either. With some venison for the freezer, it's now over to Gary to try his luck. If you, if you want to shoot off the bike you're going to have to stalk up there. And... Still cut there, we spot a group of deer on the other side of the estate, but Gary isn't happy with the shot. And when there's another chance, they're on the neighbour's ground. The direction we've come brings us to a nice area for another fox call. This time, Roy sticks Gary with David on the opposite side of the valley. He's going to call from behind a tree stump with the shotgun. If a fox comes and stops, Gary is in a better position to get a shot with the rifle. Roy is mic'd up, so he can flag up anything he sees. Fox coming along the top. Fox coming along the top. <whistles> Roy perseveres, but after five minutes is about to give up. He then hears magpies behind Gary and David, so he resumes calling. Incredibly, a fox runs straight past Gary and David. Roy has spotted it, but can't move. Oh my god, I'm still shaking. We heard the magpies kicking off right behind where the camera was. So I changed back the call again and I went back to a lighter call because it sounded like a fox was coming in through the brambles. And amazingly, the fox passed in between the camera and where I was tucked up here, followed it all the way in here, but I couldn't shoot. So then I had to wait for her to come across. And it was, really, it was difficult waiting because she was just coming, coming, coming and she got to about four or five yards. So she stopped about, just about there. Then I had to show myself around the log. She went and I just shot her as she ran off there. Daylight foxing is fantastic when it works and frustrating when it doesn't, but we've never had a case where a fox has been so intent on finding what's making the distress call that it would run straight past two people, one lying down, the other kneeling. And she ran, what, two yards past you? Maximum. Gary said he felt the whoosh as she ran past, so she came tearing past. Luckily, they were just the right side of the wind because otherwise it would have been game over. But it's amazing if the foxes are not directly looking in the direction of the squeak, what you can get away with. And so it's just come tearing past all the way along here. As I say, initially I couldn't take the shot because she was in direct line of fire for Gary and David. So I had to wait for her to come all the way across here and wait until she was here to take the shot. But yeah, superb response, very happy with that one. Once again, Mr. Lupton conjures up some quality field sport and field craft. Who mentioned anything about him losing his mojo? <coughs> First class service every time, signed for, postage paid and slapped down on the mat.